See, here's the thing is, I kind I don't know where to start either because I don't want to make this thing all about me. You know what I mean? The voice you're hearing right now is from Brittany Stone. She is the birth mother of Tanya and Rick Fernandez's nine-year-old adopted son, who we're calling Alex. If you remember, Tanya told me that Alex's mother was a close relative and a drug addict. He's funny. He's got... Smart. Very smart, very smart, and we love him. He's that's just great. a joy. Yeah, that's good. And no disabilities. He's perfectly healthy. Um, and... He's got ADHD, <laughs> but he was drug exposed in the womb, so I'm not surprised. But no, he's um, no. But he, overall, he's, he's he's healthy. Other than right, yeah. That's pretty much all I knew about Alex. But then, out of nowhere, Alex's birth mother, Brittany, contacted me. I assumed Brittany gave up her son for adoption because of her drug addiction. I assumed a lot of things. But what I didn't know was that years before Alex was born, the Fernandeses also had guardianship over Brittany too. That's right. From the age of 12 to 17, Brittany lived with the Fernandeses. She just might be the only person who could fill in the blanks for the questions that linger in our minds about this case. What is Tanya really like behind closed doors? And are the children's health issues even real? Who does Brittany think is the most likely to be sending these messages? Just imagine being a fly on the wall at the Fernandez's house. That's what Brittany is. In this bonus episode of The Stalker, we're going to hear stories about what Brittany says really happens in that house. I'm Javier Leva, and this is Pretend. Stories about real people pretending to be someone else. Are you one of those people that watch a movie and know who the killer is way before everyone else? That means your detective skills are really sharp. You should put them to the test with June's Journey. June's Journey is a game that you could download on your iOS or Android. And it's great because you're solving a mystery the entire time. June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game with a captivating detective story, taking you back to the glamours of the 1920s. In the game, you're playing the role of June Parker and you're searching for clues to uncover the mysteries behind her sister's murder. What's cool is that you could build your own luxury estate island, design it, the whole thing, and you collect scraps of information and fill them in a photo album to learn about each character. You could chat and play against other players. So instead of mindlessly scrolling through social media, try sharpening your mind and play a game like June's Journey. So can you crack the case? Download June's Journey for free today on iOS and Android. I only know their side of the story because they're the only ones I've ever talked to. You know why you're unique? This is not just about you. This is about the fact that you lived in that house. Yes. Like no one else knows. Oh, yes. Well, that, that's, here's the thing, Brittany. Here's the thing that is so interesting about the story. These people came on my podcast and you would think that they would be showing their best side, right? right. <laughs> I can't even imagine what they talk about like behind closed doors. Let's just start chronologically. How did you end up living with her to begin with? Like, how did that happen? My grandma passed away in 1997. My mom and my stepdad, they became homeless because of just many things. 
Brittany doesn't deny it. She admits she had a rough life. Oh. Is your mom there? Is yes, that your mom? Yes, here. Uh, tell oh. her I say hi. 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 <laughs> Olivia, Brittany's mom, explains to me why she made the difficult decision to give up her parental rights. At the time, living with Tanya and Rick Fernandez was the most stable move she could make for her daughter, Brittany. Brittany was 11 years old. It was like in 97. It was right after my mom died. They totally, they were helping me. I was in an abusive relationship with my husband and he hyperextended my daughter, Brittany's knee. And I didn't want her. I was trying to leave him. So I didn't want her around, you know what I mean? To be abused or anything. And Tanya, I'm doing air quotes, offered to help me and take Brittany while I navigated my way getting out of this relationship. Okay, my stepdad was abusive towards me. I didn't want to go back with him. So I I agreed to stay with my aunt and uncle is basically what it boiled down to. And that's kind of how that started out. So then I just agreed to stay there because at the time my mom was not stable and I didn't want to be anywhere near my stepdad. And your aunt and uncle, just to be clear, is Tanya and Rick. Yes, yes. Correct? Okay. Yes. And and before all that, like it sounds like you you were having a lot of trouble. I mean, you know, ab- abuse, possible homelessness, and and how close were you with Tanya and Rick before all that happened? Before you moved in with them? Well, I was I've all I was always fairly close with Rick. The whole family was fairly close with Rick until he got into the religion. That's when he kind of distanced himself from everybody. Yeah, because he wasn't a Jehovah's Witness. No. Yeah. And how old were you at the time when you moved in with him? I was 12, 1987. 12. I was 12. And so, I mean, 12 is a, you know, uh, you could clearly remember what happened at 12, yes. you know, especially the big moments, right? Yes. And so you move in with them. It was your best option at the time, it sounds right. like, right? You're right. And what was it like? At first, it was nice because, you know, like I said, my uncle Rick and I were close. And so we would watch movies together and go get ice cream. And, you mean, they would do all this fun stuff with me. And then it wasn't until that everything was settled with CPS and they had guardianship of me or custody of me that that's when I pretty much became nanny. And what kind of things would they make you do? I babysat their kids. Rick worked all day. Tanya was always out shopping or lunch with her friends or doing errands or doctor's appointments. But I was home with their kids probably more than Tanya was at 12 years old. Doing what exactly? Like cooking and cleaning? Cooking, or? cleaning, laundry. Um, if the kids needed medicine or a bath or I was literally Cinderella. Did you go to school at that time or yes. were you out of school? No, I went to school. Up until my sophomore year, my second week of sophomore year, they pulled me out of high school. Why is that? Why would they do that? Um, Okay, so I wasn't exactly the perfect child. I had, you know, obviously some issues, but I would ditch. This was their their reasons for it. But after being pulled out and being home with them, I realized the underlining of it. But I would ditch school and go and drink or go you know, hang out with my friends because that's the only kind of freedom I had. I literally had to ditch school to have a social life because once I went home, I was on lockdown. I wasn't allowed to associate with anybody at school. I had one friend that wasn't a Jehovah's Witness that I went to school with that I was allowed to associate with. And it was very limited. So I ditched school and got super, super drunk, got caught at school drunk, and they pulled me out. Around this time, Tanya and Rick only had three kids. Will, their oldest son, Logan, the oldest daughter, and Chelsea, Dr. Gresman's former patient. She was just two years old. James, the other disabled son, wasn't even born yet. I asked Brittany about Chelsea, the disabled daughter. Was she like a a normal baby or did she have health problems from the get-go or what? Here's the thing. At first, when I first moved in, I didn't see any signs of having any health issues. She seemed normal when I moved in there. And then it wasn't until shortly after that all these problems all of a sudden were there. And I've always thought since I was, since I lived there, since I was younger, that she did something to me. I've always thought that. 
Was she about two when you moved in? Yeah, I would say between two and three, I would say. Wasn't that around the time that they had that big surgery on her at two years old? Yes, I was there when she had the shunt surgery. Okay, so that was something that Tanya described, you know, that that she was so developmentally behind that, you know, they were afraid that she was not going to walk or anything like that. And then all of a sudden she had the shunt surgery and she could crawl and it was like a miracle. What was your, what's your recollection of all that? Okay. But so remember that I'm 12 years old and at 12 years old, she seemed normal. She used to do this thing where she used to sit on the ground or wherever in her high chair or wherever. And she would put her hands in the air and shake her head back and forth crazy like and and I don't remember her doing that when I first moved in there. That didn't start till months after I had moved in. And I guess that's one of the after the yes. was that after the brain shunt? No, before that was the brain before. Shunt? Okay. That was before the brain surgery. Okay. That's when I started yeah. noticing that something wasn't right with her because she wasn't doing that when I first moved in. She would shake her head so bad I thought she was gonna break her neck. But the, it, just to be clear, the shaking of the head that happened before the brain shunt? Before this yes. Okay, so maybe that is a sign that something was a little off, right? Okay. Yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's really possible that she was born with a disability. That's what's hard about the story is that it's hard to tell what's true and what's not true, you know, about what Tanya says. Right, right. And what about you? Did did you ever have any weird medical issues while living there? No. That seems suspicious or anything like that? Nope. Brittany tells me that James was her favorite of the kids because she was around when he was born. Yes, that kid was fine. He was fine when I lived there. Yeah, so nothing... As far as development and milestones and all that, he was fine. Yeah, that's interesting because like she says her two mentally disabled children, both those kids, or they're not kids now, they're adults, both of them have lost their rights. They have guardianship the parents have guardianship over them. So it's like, you would think that it would be pretty severe mental disability, right? But that's not what you saw? Yeah. No, see, and that just blows my mind. I didn't know they had guardianship of until I listened to your podcast, and that blows my mind. I asked Brittany about her relationship with Will, you know, the oldest son, who is a registered sex offender. was a little shit as a kid. <laughs> and it's not like... I don't mean anything bad by that. All little kids are little shit. I got four boys, I know, but he was the roughest. He was the toughest, and he was the the, the he had the smartest mouth of the four. Are any of those kids, to your knowledge, I mean, from your experience, not that you could answer definitively, but are any of those uh, uh, children capable of being the stalker? Okay, so setting emotions aside, I have a. I don't want to say a hunch. I'm I'm pulling towards the name I just bleeped out was James because he has more than motive to want to get out of that house. There is no reason why he should have guardian. They should have guardianship of him. None. Brittany tells me that she suspects that the stalker could be James, the Fernandez's disabled son. I asked her if she thought the stalker was Chelsea, the Fernandez's disabled daughter. I think that is more capable than. Mm-hmm. Her parents are letting everybody to believe. Then I asked her about Logan, the Rodriguez's oldest daughter, who the postal inspector accused of being the stalker. Remember, she was the one that was treated for depression when the stalking was happening. That girl has always been very quiet, very reserved, very um, respectful. Never had any problems with as a kid. They never had. She, I mean, she'd get a little sassy here and there, but what kid doesn't, you know, but has so much potential and Tanya has sheltered her so much that I mean she could have motive but I don't see it at all and and you haven't can I share I mean just we're gonna keep going down this track but I want to I did not air this because it's too gross to put on online okay um but I'm going to read it to you just so that mm-hmm. I think that it is important and, and like, sorry if it's really nasty and, and whatever. Let me see. Cause this is the way that the, the, the stalker talks about his kid. Um, 
had to put little asshole to sleep because wifey is up and lazy, but hold on. This is, I got to show you the real, real nasty stuff. By the way, warning, I am about to read some really disturbing text messages from the stalker. It involves sexual child abuse. So if this makes you uncomfortable, please skip 30 seconds ahead. Oh, here we go. Here we go. I found it. He's talking about his daughter, right? This is the doctor's husband's daughter. He's supposedly a, a caretaker. Yeah, he says, I feel like oh, I feel like her little then lick rubbing her little letting her Are you kidding me? Okay, knowing that, I have not aired that because it's nasty. Oh my God. But I almost I, I almost feel like I have to though. You know what I mean? Like because I don't think that people really, yeah. they, they hear about the pizza pranks and they hear about the, you know, like the wife, it, like this little stupid stuff. But this, this is disgusting, isn't it? That is disgusting. People need to know how, dis how they need to know. Oh my God. I don't even believe that. Wow. Yes. So, quick question in between this. I just want to ask you, did they take this baby in for any kind of testing to see if she had been at all touched or anything after these messages were came to light? Well, Tanya, Tanya called, well, you see, you're, you're thinking about this as a, you're thinking about this like it's real. Okay. And so okay, you're right. it's not real. Yes. Right. Like the doctor, the doctor. Right, right, okay. You know what I mean? Like I, I had, you're no, no, no. What you're going through, right. I had to go through the same thing. It's like, oh, okay. this is not real. Yeah, That's just, forget. and we know that, but yeah, because of yes. everything we, right. But yeah, but Tanya did call CPS and CPS did investigate this and CPS Good. dismissed it. Okay. That is um, so disgusting. But anyway, just, I, I hate that I had to show you that, but like who in that family could write something yeah. that disgusting? So uh, definitely not. She's talking about Chelsea. There is no way in hell that would be no way in hell. I could see her writing hateful messages. I can't see her writing something like that. I really can't. That's that. It like the lady in your pod. That's all male. That's mm. like you, she said that screams sexual mm -hmm. frustration and those kids don't have from a life. A, that they do not they don't have social lives they're not allowed to have girlfriends unless it's to hold the witnesses and then even every any, even then it's mod everything is supervised everything especially with tanya is supervised they can't step out of that house without a helicopter over them i know personally Brittany brought up Will again, the oldest Fernandez son. So let's talk about He already know the cons, you know what I mean? He knows the cons. He's already, he's like you guys said in the podcast, he's an obvious suspect, too obvious. But to maybe to think that now that I've seen that and to know his background of sending ridiculous, raunchy, disgusting messages to people. Mm. Maybe him thinking that he will not get caught this time. Hmm. So, so you're alluding that he has done something like this before? Like what? I mean, do you know why he's a sex offender? Well, let, let's talk about that. I only know Tanya's version of this. My son, his name is and is 27. Okay. This happened when he was like 20. And he's really naive and kind of childlike and stupid and he doesn't listen. And, um, and I would always tell him like, never, ever, 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 ever put yourself in a position where you could get accused of doing something to a girl. And he's like, mom, I'm not that stupid. And I said, well, I kind of think you are. So don't ever put yourself in that position. So what does he do? puts himself in that position. This girl that was like friends of a friend of a friend, this 14 year old girl um, thought he was cool. And so this girl wanted guitar lessons and I was totally against it. I said, please don't do that. I think it's stupid. Make a long story short, I had a girlfriend at the time and this little girl got jealous 
of talking to his girlfriend because they had kind of broken up. So she accused our son of of molesting her when in actuality it was the other way around. Like she was being inappropriate with him. And but they but I'm not going to sit here and say that he's an innocent. He's innocent because it was just like two stupid kids doing stupid crap and they did not have sex. They came pretty close to it, but he was not comfortable because of her age. And he told her, like, I don't want to have sex with you. Put your clothes back on kind of thing. Well, she went home and told her dad, like, touch me, you know, blah, blah, blah. And um, it, as it stands, like, he did get arrested, our son. And it was, like, the worst time possible. His life was forever more changed. And he he regrets not listening to us. He spent 10 months in jail. We had to hire a very expensive attorney who said, I can totally see through this. It's ridiculous. But unfortunately, he's going to get tagged a sex offender. And he, he regrets ever not listening to his parents. When I got to part 11 of your podcast is when it really after you guys were talking about the motives behind it and after I found out that they had guardianship of him and the unnecessary brain surgery, which blows my mind, by the way, but I'm leaning towards. She said James, the disabled son. Then she considered Will, the oldest son. But after seeing what you just showed me and after knowing Jake's history. No, I have no idea, but it's definitely a male. When we come back from the break. We'll hear what Brittany says about Rick and Tanya being the stalker. So what about Tanya and Rick? Does Brittany think that they're capable of sending these vile messages? If Tanya has any part of it, she either was the one who initiated it and had her kids finish it off or vice versa. Okay, there is a part in that podcast when you bring to the light that maybe could be the soccer, a possible suspect. And she mm -hmm. laughs about that. And her laugh is almost like, haha, nope. Like, almost like, I don't even know the word antagonize you like, that you don't that you would could possibly think it's when it's really her. It was almost like an evil laugh. Like, I know. Yeah, oh, yeah. Very well. That and, laugh. Yes. I don't understand what's funny about talking about past experiences of your family getting death threats. There's nothing humorous about that. I mean, a lot of people have a nervous laugh, but I'm with you. Everybody kind of picks up on that laugh. It was not, very Tanya unnerving. A nervous laugh. Tanya's got an evil laugh, but that's just my opinion. Rick, I think I honestly feel like Rick is oblivious to it. <sighs> I can't wrap my head around Rick, man. Uh, but you got to remember, I was close to him at one point, even yeah. after the religion changing him and him as a person. I cannot see my uncle being that disgusting. I can't. I really can't. I can't see him having any part of it. Is he really that oblivious, though? Yes. I mean and even if he's not oblivious to it, which I really feel like he's oblivious to most of this, at least... I really feel like he doesn't know anything, but even let's just say he did hypothetically. If he was to go against Tanya, he has nothing. She will leave him with nothing. So now let's talk about Tanya. I mean, could she, is she capable of writing something that filthy? Who? Tanya? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Tanya is, is capable of anything. Yes. Tanya comes off as this perfect Jehovah's Witness, doesn't cuss. She cusses like a sailor at home. So the and so when she said that she was really uncomfortable reading those text messages that she read to you in the podcast, I laughed because no, she wasn't. She is She's raunchy. just embarrassed. She's just probably more embarrassed that other people are hearing it. Right. Or maybe that's it. I don't know. But or she's just she's really good at coming off as somebody that she's not. She is a great manipulator. Very two-faced. Which is so weird. Like, why would anybody agree to that? But but like you said, they're they you know when when I talk about I've I've interviewed people on cults before. Like I 
I've done a lot of research on that. And if I called them right now and be like, Hey, you know, I had, I bought you a house and a car and you're safe. You could do whatever you want. And I got you a lawyer and you could have your freedom. Like if I, you know, if I said that they probably wouldn't take it because cult leaders or cult members are the same. You know, it's like they, right. like this cult that I interviewed, they locked men, grown men in a building for a year. Okay. With the windows unlocked and the doors unlocked. Okay. Like they could have gotten out anytime and wow. they don't because of that control. Right. Right. And Tanya kind of gives me cult leader vibes, you know? Oh yeah. She's, yeah. That is Tanya brainwashing her, her whole life with this world is so bad out there and you're safe right here because she did the same yeah. thing to me. The outside world is not good. And as long as you're right here with us, you're, you're safe and you'll be taken care of. What you just, what you just said, I don't know if you're a cult expert. It's exactly <laughs> now that's yeah. how cults operate. Oh, yeah. okay. She did that my whole, my whole time I was there. That was one of her main things that she would constantly throw in my face that as long as I was there with them, I was taken care of and I was safe. All right, let's go down that road because we did the suspect right. thing. That was just something I was really curious about because you have such a unique perspective. But like you're living there, right? And you started describing that, you know, at first it was great. They'll take you out to ice cream. Things were awesome. But then you slowly became like what, like you said, their servant, almost like Cinderella, yes. right? Living in their house. In all honesty, probably weren't an angel. Like you said, you were probably getting into a lot of trouble, skipping school, maybe drugs, alcohol, whatever, right? It doesn't matter. But you were like, not living the, their lifestyle. I was, right? I was a typical teenage girl who had just lost her grandma that I was very close to. And then now I wasn't with my mom and my brand new sister. And then yeah. I was now being restricted from having any kind of social life. So yeah, I outlasted a little bit. What actions did they take other than getting you out of school? Like, did they try to force you to go to church or like what, what kind of actions did they take to kind of tame you a little bit? Um, well, I mean, I was grounded here and there, you know, I mean, how do you, how do you punish somebody who already does everything at the house? Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I never really got any, they never spanked me. I mean, Tanya and I had a couple physical fights a few times, but as far as like spankings or um, anything like that, nothing. But I, and like I said, I got grounded a few times, but that wasn't anything because I already wasn't allowed to do anything. Uh, yeah. What you're uh, saying is that how do you take away nothing, right? Right. Like there was nothing I didn't have, to take I mean, Maybe away. I wasn't allowed to talk on the phone for right. a few days with the select friends I was allowed to have. So that, I yeah. mean, that might have been the worst of it. Well, what about like church or like, you know, the Jehovah's Witness? Um, okay, what do they so call that, it? Um, that started out. Kingdom Hall. Right? I was okay with going. At, you know, like it was something new. I was 12 years old going through the, I just lost my grandma. So the whole paradise and seeing her thing again at 12 years old sounded wonderful. Okay. So I was all for it in the beginning. Now, was I, did I truly believe it all? Or I don't, I can't really say, you know what I mean? But I was for the whole idea of seeing my grandma again in paradise. And it probably wasn't until eighth grade, maybe my freshman year that I started realizing that that religion is, it's a straight cult. Remember, Brittany lived in the Fernandez's house for five years, from the age of 12 to 17 years old. I wanted to know why she decided to leave. So here's the thing. Tanya was court ordered to quit. She used to record mine and my mom's phone calls. Okay. Well, we were still in the custody battle and it was court ordered for her to stop recording mine and my mom's phone calls. Well, I had found a tape recorder in the buried in a garage in the garage it was recording. So I took the tape out and I put it in my stereo and I recorded over all the phone calls and I went and put it back in her recorder. Wow. So it was a blank tape. <laughs> so she was pissed. Okay. And I did it because I knew she would be mad and I knew she would come and confront me. And I, that was my moment to tell her, well, that's something you're not supposed to be doing anyway. So why are you doing it? So that's exactly what happened. She came in my room and she asked me if I knew about the tape recorder. And I told her, yeah. And I told her, she asked me if I knew why it was blank. And I told her because I recorded over it because you're not supposed to be doing that anymore. And she got angry. 
my favorite thing to do when I was a kid was to slam doors. So she got mad at me and she slammed my bedroom door when she walked out. So I opened my door and I told her we don't slam doors in this house because that's what she always told me. So she got mad and she told me that she said, this is my house. I'll do what I want. And I said, no, this is my uncle's house. You just live here. <laughs> and Burn. she came at me so fast she came flying at me and that was one of the physical things we had gotten into my uncle my poor uncle went he just ran up to the store to get some milk and bread real quick and came back to me and tanya having it out on the couch had no idea what was going on and um i finally just told them i don't want to go to your meetings anymore I'm sick of all of your guys. I'm sick of Tanya's shit. I don't want to go to the meetings anymore. I want nothing to do with the religion. I don't want anything to do with Tanya. And Tanya told me to pack my shit and call my mom. So I did. At that point, did she have legal guardianship over you? Yes. And so, but she was willing to just forfeit that yes. and have you go with your mom. Well, because at that point, she, I think she realized that she couldn't control me anymore. The whole thing with me taking the tape out and recording over it and putting back in, she knew I was onto her. So there's, she couldn't play her little games with me anymore, and that pissed her off. She still got child support for you, though. And she's, yeah, they still got child support for me for that next year. From, from the when state? I was yes. Even though I wasn't from, living there. From me. Anymore. Oh, from, from Olivia? Yeah. Yeah. They clicked You oh, had to yeah, pay her? Wow. State. Yeah, yeah, because they had guardianship. Because, so yeah, so from, the, from my time I moved out of there to 17 to 18, they were still collecting child support for me. From your mom? Yes. And what kind of relationship did you have with Olivia, with your mom at the time? With my mom? Yeah. I wasn't allowed to have a good one. At any time, you know, they would tell me that my mom was a bad person because she wasn't a JW, that she was bad association. Tanya would constantly bring up how my mom was not in her right state of mind because of drugs, which is none of her business. My mom was grown. I wanted to know if Brittany was out of the house... How did Tanya and Rick end up adopting Brittany's youngest son, who we're calling Alex, years later? Alex, by the way, his birth name was Mannix. And that's how we'll refer to him in this interview. Okay, so you had you have your firstborn, and then at some point you have your second, your third, and then fourth, which is Mannix. I didn't talk to her on a regular basis. Right, right. But but you were still in touch. I mean, it wasn't like a bad. I mean, I know it ended bad, but it was still like every now yeah, and then. Yeah, like I would, would talk to them, you know, once and then it would be maybe a year or okay. like even maybe even a little bit longer. And we would talk here and there, but it was never in depth and it was for never for very long. You know what I mean? Right. It was just kind of like, hi, how you doing? How are the kids? Right. And that was basically it. And so then you have Mannix. And, but they didn't really get custody of him until he was what, four? Five months. Yes, he was very young. He wasn't even a year old yet. So, do you want to know how that happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you don't mind. Okay. So, okay. I broke my hand, uh, my left hand, which is my dominant hand. And my mom had some things going on. She has a skin condition in every, well, it was happening more often back then than it has recently and it was contagious but it would look like it was like dry glue on her hands peeling off it was very painful for her and so with a broken hand my mom can't really help me out i made the biggest mistake of my life of calling my aunt for help i asked her if she could take manage just till i got my cast off my hand because I couldn't, he was five months old. It was hard, you know, you still got to hold their heads and stuff. At the end. None of my kids were old enough to help me with anything. They were nine, five, and four. They weren't capable of doing things with an infant. So I made the mistake of calling her to help me. And she had him for a week. And I told her she could bring him back. And uh, that's when CPS showed up at my door. Oh, so they reported you? Yes. So here's what's funny about that. So in the podcast, so I, I want to go back and listen to it again, but. And there's the more. Of- so like, I have to go back and listen. Cause you know, I didn't, didn't really post a lot about that because I didn't well, think it was this- relevant. So there's more and I'll let you listen to it, but yeah, go on. What were you okay. Saying? So the beginning of the stalker incident, how it just kind of goes to the threats of, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Then it's quiet for however many months, three months or whatever. And then when the stalker comes back up, the threats get intensified by threatening to harm his daughter, correct? His own daughter. Right. Right. Okay, so here's what I find funny about that. Because with Tanya in the CPS case, she called December 6th and made a report that I neglected my children. There was never nothing to eat in my house. I was never home. I was just all kinds of stuff. Well, that didn't get enough attention. So she called December 16th and said all of the same things except for she added on that I admitted to shaking my child. So she intensified the report to assure that they were at my door that day. So I just find it funny that the podcast story goes from just these subtle little things to all of a sudden now he's threatening his own infant daughter. And then my, she's just makes these subtle little accusations to all of a sudden I'm harming my child. I have to ask you this, but did you ever harm Max? No. no. And I even told the caseworker, I have a nine-year-old son. I've been a single mom for most of all of my children. Why in the hell would I wait until my fourth child to become abusive? Have you ever had any problems with no. law enforcement and your children no. being involved? No. So when they read me the report, the second time when they came to my house, they were at my house. They came up to my house after hours on a Sunday with two police officers. The very first time they knew they were taking my kids. The very first time they were ever on my doorstep. They were there less than 20 minutes before they were telling me to pack Aiden and Mark's bags. Did they take did they take all your kids away from you or just Maddox? So my oldest son, Alex, wasn't in. He didn't get involved in the case because when CPS got called and was brought out, he was already his. He went to his dad's every other weekend. So that okay. was his dad's weekend. So Alex already wasn't home. So he was automatically not in the case because he was already out of the home. She already had Maddox because I had given him to her. So when they came to my house, I only had Aiden and Mark. So and what did they do with Aiden and Mark? They took her them to Tanya. Okay. So now that's interesting though, because your mom wasn't in, in a spot to, to take care of them. Why Tanya of all people? Was there not anybody else that they could have taken them to? All of my friends have kids. A lot of kids, you know, all of my yeah. friends then. They, yeah. There was nobody I really knew that was that could take a child and be suitable to take care of a child that didn't already have their hands full with their own children. Hmm. And I really, to answer your question, I don't know why I chose Tanya. I really don't. You just thought she was family. Uh, yeah. And, well, I mean, yeah, I thought she was family. I didn't think I would have anything to worry about, honestly. So now she has three of your children? Yes. So how does she end up with just one of them with just okay Maddox. so here's what happens they she got my kids december 16th 2012. okay january 5th 2016 i get a call from the investigating officer at cps asking me if i want to visit my kids now mind you i haven't seen them since they gotten taken away so that's two weeks without seeing my kids who i used to see every day okay and so i was hell yeah i want to see my kids so i got a ride down there I visited with them for two hours. And then at the end of the visit is when the caseworker told me that Tanya called CPS that morning and told CPS to come and get my children because she couldn't handle it anymore. So then okay. my children ended up in, in a foster home for two months. All when of they them? All three fine. of them? Yes. So then when it came time to place my children somewhere else, she was willing to fight for Mannix, but she didn't want Aiden and Mark. And why do you think that is? Because they could talk. I know that's what it was. They could talk. And, and he was, he was still a baby? Yes. He was less than, a, he was younger than a year. He was born July 20th. Tanya and Rick had custody of Mannix since he was a year old. The adoption didn't happen until years later. That explains how they were able to adopt a baby with a sex offender living in the house. How were they able to get the adoption to go through did you agree to that i got my my rights were severed the state i was it didn't matter what hoops i went through or what i did nothing was ever good enough i begged my caseworker to admit me into a rehab just to show that i was willing to do and i got ignored for months hmm. about it he did nothing the state did nothing to really help me it how wasn't bad was your Huh? No, I was, I was going to say, how bad was your situation at the time? 
Well, if that if towards the end of the case, it was bad because I'd just given up, honestly, mm-hmm. because it didn't matter what I did or how I did it and nothing was ever good enough. And I really feel like Tanya had somebody on the inside, just the way things kept going in her favor. Everything went in that lady's favor, that whole case. Well, she told me that that the, that Mannix, you know, he has ADHD because uh, his mother was so drug induced while she was okay. pregnant with him. So here's what's funny about that is they don't test the baby's first poop anymore. They now test the umbilical cord blood. Okay. That can go back to three months or three to five months of pregnancy. If my child was drug induced at birth or even in the womb, how did he go home with me? Why wasn't CPS involved at birth? Why didn't, why did it take five months later of her calling and making two false reports to get CPS at my door? If my child had drugs in his system. I mean, this is a person who we know, even when I say we, me and my audience know that she is willing to call CPS Yes. for, I mean, anybody should call CPS if they see something wrong happening, right? But like, we know that, I, 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 I told you that I'm just making a lot of assumptions that you're in a much better place than you were back then. Are you in a much better place? Yes. Like, yes. 100%. 100 percent. 100, yes, percent. Arizona is not a place you want to, you know, to thrive anywhere. It's Phoenix is horrible, is a horrible place. So, yeah, I got out of there and I am definitely in a much better place. And yeah. like I read the text message that your your son sent because that was like really sweet, you know, that your sons said that because I, I bet this doesn't even come up normally right but because of all this and because you've been thinking right. about it i'll read it they said me aiden mark all all over the years never even had suspicions that you were using drugs because you're a great mom and there was never a scenario where drugs were even brought up i think the only thing that we knew at the age was weed and we were never around drugs exposed to drugs none of that obviously you would smoke a cigarette here and there and something but never ever seen you even drink laugh out loud I think I've seen you drunk maybe three times in my entire life. I remember when you told me that you were using and I thought you were lying to me because I never thought that you did stuff like that. What I'm trying to say is that you were always there and there was never a case where we had to worry about your health because we didn't need to. Yes. I mean, that that's really like sweet. You know, like I, I, yeah. I don't even know you guys. I'm I like cried that. like a little yeah. baby. <laughs> yes. So. I mean, Mike, I've asked, I've asked my kids too throughout the years. And especially now that I'm, I'm in a better mindset and sober, if they've ever f- had a feeling like I failed them or I wasn't there. And all of them have always told me, even if you weren't physically there, mom, you've always been there for us in any way you could be. And so you right now you are back together with Three out of your four sons, right? And well, my oldest still lives in Phoenix. He's 19, though, so he kind of... He's, yeah, you know, he's an adult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, he was just out here. He just came out here for Christmas. But, yes, my two middle boys are back with me. They live here. And But, I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, not having Maddox. Like, how no, does that... It, I was ecstatic when I got... Aiden and Mark back because it's been 10 long years, you know, it's been a long time for us. And I was close with my kids. I mean, I still am, but when all that stuff happened with them, a huge piece of me died. And so to have two of my kids come home with me, definitely made me happy. So with did everything going on with Mannix like that, that would like, I don't even know what to say. I'm just, I would love to have him home with me. And has she ever reached out to you so you could talk to him or it's been like Actually, a clean break? I have messages. Um, I just downloaded, I don't use Instagram. Um, I just downloaded Instagram and uh, I, I haven't logged into it or nothing yet because I don't use Instagram like ever. So it was just a waste of space on my phone. Yeah. 
But shortly before I came back out here this time, which I came out here October, not last October, but the to- October before that. So it was probably like three or four months before I came out here then. Um, she had messaged me on Instagram kind of just like touching, you know, asked me how I was doing or whatever. And then I, I can't remember too much of the messages. I need to reread them or, and I can even send them to you, but yeah, it got to the conversation. of would you like to see Mannix? And I was, who wouldn't want to see their kid? You know what I mean? So yeah, I was all for it. Well, we talked a little bit more about it and some other stuff. Well, then the next morning I woke up to a message from her, you know, to kind of just, a friendly conversation at first is what it turned or what it started as. And then it turned into, she wanted me to take accountability for every single thing that happened in the CPS case, which I don't have a problem taking accountability for where I messed up at. You know what I mean? I don't, I'll own up to my shit. No problem. But there was a lot of wrongdoing. There was a lot of lies told. There was a lot of exaggeration told and a lot of things to make me look like I was this monster that, didn't take care of her children at all. And so, no, I wasn't going to take full accountability for everything that happened. And she didn't like that my response. Well then, so her next thing was, well, if you don't have a COVID shot, then I'm not comfortable with you seeing him. Why would you message me asking me if I want to see him and that not be the first thing you ask me? Why make it sound like it's going to happen and then shoot me down again with, with, if you don't have a COVID shot, it's not going to happen. So I pretty much told her to leave. You know what I mean? I didn't want Uh to engage in the conversation anymore because she was, I just like, she was holding him over my head and she, that, that really messed with my head for a while. I bet. Yeah. And she, she, and she knew what she was doing the whole time. She knows she's not, She's two-faced and very manipulative, like I've been saying. She knew what she was doing when she wrote me those messages on Instagram. Do you ever have hopes that maybe you could reconnect with Mannix one day? Yes. I really, like, that would be the best thing that could ever happen to me and my kids, is to have him back in our lives. Because this is interesting, because your rights were severed, like, or terminated, or whatever the, the term is. But... Things have changed. <laughs> in July, yeah. Mannix, his adopted parents, could very well be felons. Right. What does that do f- for your scenario? I mean, I, whatever I got to do, whatever it takes to show the state that I most definitely want my child back and I, I most definitely am in a better state of mind and just a better way of living than I was, uh, whatever I need to do. Do you think that's a possibility? I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say yes or no, because you know, they, they can, the system has failed us. So many yeah, times they, already. this no. system has already failed me so many times already that I don't want to get my hopes up. Look, you got two things, two things in your favor. Okay. If they get okay. convicted of a felon, that means both parents are convicted of a felony. Right. And you have a registered sex offender living in that house with a minor. Yes. That should have been a huge red flag from the get. I don't understand how the state has allowed that for so many years with and then she's got this new baby. How is that possible? Does she really have a baby? That's a no, doll, no. supposedly. I've been told that she that CPS is told my mom, that that baby is a doll. I asked Olivia, Brittany's mother, to describe the call with Child Protective Services. You've actually gotten in contact with CPS. And w- what did they tell you? She said, um, she said, yes, we saw the baby. It is a doll. And I said, you saw the baby firsthand. She said, yes. And I said, there's people that are seeing this baby. They're hauling this baby in and out of a car and that's a doll and she said yes and i said there's no way and she said yes i said well you must be friends with them and she said nope and i said well i don't believe any of this i was livid i cannot even believe it i don't know i'm in shock either way why would you take the time out to put a baby in a car seat strap the car seat in the car unstrap the car seat, take it out of the car, take it to inside wherever you're going, yeah, it place it. Like, sense. why would you go through all that when your hands are already so full? Have you seen the picture of the baby? 
I've I've only seen that one picture. That, she that is not on a baby. If you zoom in on that picture and you zoom into the pacifier, past the pacifier is milk residue on that baby's lips. You're saying that's not a baby doll. That's a the baby. Doll. Yes, that's what I meant. It's not a doll. Scratches on his head. That is not a doll. And then if you zoom in to his or her eyebrows, I call them chalk scratches because the, the babies are so used to being in the womb and they keep their hands so close to their face and their nails are so long. That when they and their skin they is so dry, themselves. so when they scratch right. themselves, it looks like chalk on their face. There is a chalk scratch on the top right of that baby of that doll's eyebrow. Right of the baby. Yes. Yeah. Let let me let me share my screen one more time. Let's okay. look at this because I did not honestly. I didn't even pick up on that. Oh, sorry, wrong button. <laughs> I didn't even pick up on that until you 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 or your mom said that. So this is the, I posted the blurred picture of the baby because I just felt, you know, like if this is a baby. Yeah. Okay. Now see okay. right there on top of that, eye, the right eyebrow. See that yeah. white mark? That's There's chalk like scratch. Now zoom in. Right. Zoom in on the lips. There's. See that white stuff past the pacifier? Well, what is that? It, it's either saliva not, or, or it's, it's milk. Definitely. Exactly. That is not a doll. I'm sorry. And the soft spot on the head. And there's a, you can see the, so you can Oops, see the soft sorry. spot on the head. If that's a doll, somebody has Oops, a lot of time on their hands. I mean, th the thing about this picture for anyone who hasn't seen it is that it really looks like a fresh baby. You know how like when, when they show babies in the movies and you're like, yeah. oh, come on, that baby's like two, four months Five old months or something there. like that. Yeah. No, yeah. this is a brand spanking new baby that his her eyes have barely opened. There's yeah, there's barely a crease. You can see the little baby acne on the nose. You can see the little you can it's that's like a, a doll. That's what you're saying it a doll wouldn't have so many imperfections. Yes. Right. That's a chalk scratch. That's I mean, I'm sure that's not what they're called. It's just a scratch, but that's what I, you know what I mean? Because I know like what you're saying. I know what you're saying. Because they have like little sharp nails and yeah. yes. And the soft spot. You see that soft spot on the head? Zoom in on the head, uh -huh. please. Oh, 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 right here. Yeah, right? No, go up on the top of the head. See how there's yeah. that indention? Sorry, my, Your know. cursor's right on it right now. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. Soft spot. And if it is and more a, scratches, is, more scratches right here. If it's a doll, that doesn't help their case at either, all. I don't think. Like that just makes Tanya look even more psycho. She's hauling around a doll. Well, yeah, but okay. So let's let's assume that it's a doll. That's weird, right? But For let's no. assume it's a real baby. What the hell does that right. mean? And whose baby is that? Like, if yes. you, I mean, I know you're not there, but it's like. And how is that okay as with having a sex offender in the house? How is that okay? And it's not like he was a sex offender for um, indecent exposure or he's a sex offender with a minor. Kidnapping too. He was Kidnapping too? That's what it showed on the court records. I oh, wow. Kidnapping kid too. I didn't well, even know that. No, part. but here's the thing. Hey, kidnapping in a legal sense is not what we think of oh, okay. kidnapping well, very true. So okay, you're right. he's a tw he's a 20 year old with a 14 year old if he is alone with her and she says that that she could not leave like he wouldn't let her leave that's kidnapping okay even if it's yeah. like um he blocked the door or like you know he like implied that he was going to step in front of the door that's kidnapping okay okay so right. it's not like he didn't snatch her so, and put so her in a van. Right. Right. He's involved so, with the minor. But he's 20 years old and he's and she's 14 years old. You know, a lot of people would dismiss statutory as like, ah, they're close. But this is this is not close. The Mannix thing now it makes a little bit more sense because now hearing your story, they had Mannix way before was convicted of a sex offense. As a sex offender. Yeah. And how do you feel about the name change? The fact that she changed his name from Maddox. I, you know what's funny is um, 
there was a, a time that we were at court, all of us, we had a court hearing. I don't remember which one it was or when it was, but it was during you know the process. And I had gotten word that she was going to change his name. And I waited for her outside of the courtroom. And I followed her down the stairs and told her that his name will never be. It will always be Mannix. I will never refer to him as ever. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it just kind of makes me upset because her whole reasoning behind it was to give him a fresh start. He was five months old at the time. He didn't even know his name yet. It wasn't to give him a fresh start. It's because you wanted a fresh baby. She wanted a fresh baby. A former friend of mine and I were at Walmart and um, we were at the checkout line getting ready to walk out the door and she was passing by and, you know, we stopped and said hi or whatever. Well, I even called Amber the other day and asked her if she remembered this happening and she said she remembers Tanya saying that she was jealous of me because I had my first child at 18 years old and all of my children were perfectly healthy and then so I have my fourth kid and she finds a way to get them. One last thing before we go, I wanted to give you an update on the trial. I requested an audio recording from Superior Court of Arizona on the pre-trial conference that took place on May 1st. Hello there, Tanya Marie Fernandez. These are CR 2023-00612-3001. Ricky Lupe Fernandez. All right, and then for uh, Ms. Tanya Fernandez? Yes, Your Honor. A pretrial conference is basically where the judge and the state's attorneys and the defendant's attorneys meet to discuss if the trial is on track. Basically, the judge wants to know, has the state made any plea deals? Are there going to be any delays that would affect the date of the trial? Those kinds of things. Yes, I did get a report in uh, one of the cases that indicates there has not been an offer made and... I'm wondering if that's the case in both cases and where we are generally. Judge Margaret LaBianca asked defense attorneys to give a status on their case. For Mr. Fernandez, there's been no offer yet. We still have uh, at least 10 interviews to go as well, Your Honor. Tanya and Rick's attorneys said that they are still in discovery and they have a handful of interviews to complete. Who are these interviews with? I, I don't know. That's That part's not clear. Okay. And my expectation is that trial preparation does occur even as um, there is discussion just so it doesn't get stretched out too long. Neither counsel is giving a reason why these, this trial date's not realistic, but certainly if something comes up and there's issues, they'll, I'm sure we'll file motions and we'll, we'll see where we are. Anything from the state on status? Here are my notes from the spot to simply indicate that uh, plea negotiations are ongoing. They are ongoing. Okay. Any indication she plans to make an offer? She indicates she will touch base with defense in the near future, but... The judge then asks if the state has offered any plea deals. The state said no deal has been made, but they do plan on reaching out to the defense attorneys in the future. So what does that mean? That means that there's still a chance that Tanya and Rick could accept a plea deal, maybe accept lesser charges, a lighter sentence. I don't know. If that happens, there is no trial. Basically, the judge explained to Tanya and Rick that the ball is in their court. And just uh, to our parties here, I just want to give a little context to what I'm talking about. Um, you know, when there are charges, um, charges get resolved in, generally speaking, one of two ways. Either there's an agreement and uh, the parties resolve it by agreement or there's trial. And the decision whether it's resolved by agreement or resolved by trial is defendant's choice. They could ultimately decide between now and the trial to plead guilty or to see this thing through in front of a jury. Of course, if anything changes with this case, I will let you know. I don't know how many update episodes I will have between now and the trial. This is an ongoing story, so anything could happen. My advice is to stay subscribed. My Pretend Plus and Patreon supporters will be the first to know. So stay tuned, and we'll talk real soon. All right. Um, thanks very much. We'll see you in June. Okay, thank thank you. Take care. Thank you. Take care. 
creative power.